Shortly after they began dating, 44-year-old Fred wanted to move in with 52-year-old Soraya, but she wasn't ready. Her ex-husband was distant and many times went silent on her, and she was worried that in a new relationship, the same thing would happen once she got married. However, she does want to get married and made that known to Fred that she would not move in with him prior to getting engaged. Fast forward to just a few weeks ago when they had their one-year anniversary dinner, Fred confessed that not only was he not ready for marriage, but he did not want to get engaged. On this episode of Make Him Wonder, you're going to hear what Soraya said to Fred that didn't help move things along and actually set them back a bit. There is no need to break up here. However, Soraya finds out from our coaching conversation what is most important for her to focus on to get Fred to make a decision to commit so she can have what she truly desires and deserves. An interesting coaching conversation. If you are in a situation like Soraya is with any man in your life, so I trust you will learn and take a leap forward by listening to this episode with Soraya. I'm so thankful for your advice. I love how intelligent and eloquent you are and still have love and given me some great guidance and direction. And now it's up to me to execute it. I feel a lot better just working through it. I thank you so, so much. I feel like you already are instilling more confidence in me that this is possible. Sick of sacrificing or settling in your romantic life? Welcome to Make Him Wonder with Coach Paula Grooms where women struggling in real relationships ask the expert. Unscripted, unfiltered, understandable coaching conversations to help passionate women succeed in love. Hi there and welcome to Make Him Wonder. I'm your host, Coach Paula, a dating and relationship coach, licensed social worker and author of the book, Why Won't He Commit? A Man Decides to Make You the One. Back from Season 3, Episode 11, 52-year-old Soraya is continuing her relationship with 44-year-old Fred. In our previous discussion, which was about nine months ago, Soraya was worried that her relationship with Fred was going too fast, as the two had only known each other for a few months, yet were spending almost every night together. And despite knowing that she should have set better boundaries, Soraya couldn't help herself and would say yes to Fred instead of saying no. Fast forward to Soraya and Fred recently reaching their one year anniversary. While Soraya had visions of a proposal, Fred told her that he is not ready to get married nor engaged. Soraya states there have been no breakups, but Fred did go silent for three days about six weeks ago. Soraya says she can't stand the thought of losing Fred, but doesn't want to continue and waste years of her life if he is not willing to invest in her and their future together. Soraya comes back on Make Him Wonder today, asking if I feel she should stay or move on and how she should proceed from here. Welcome back, Soraya. Hi, Paula. Thank you for having me again. Mm-hmm. So tell me most of all what has transpired that has made things a bit different from last time. Okay, so we didn't have the problem of him spending the night um, every night like we used to because he started working night shift. And that happened like four months into our relationship. So him working night shifts, of course, makes it more difficult for him to be spending the night. We also, he only spends the night now when his days are off, when he has his days off. But if I have my grandkids, he doesn't spend the night at all still. What else has transpired? Um, now I take at least a week, one day out of the week off, a, a little break from him, at least one day out of the week, like I just said. When you say you take a break once a week, what do you mean? Like I just tell him that, you know, I have things to do or I'm going to go with a friend to the movies or dinner or I just want to relax at home and like he suggested, do my nails or grow things. That's a change for you from last time, I believe. Oh, yes, it is. Yeah. Oh, and I did forget to mention that um, even though he's working night shift, he does come over before he goes to work. So we have dinner practically every night together. We don't have sex when he doesn't work because I don't like to have sex with him not being able to cuddle afterwards. I forgot to mention all of that. But 
like I said, during that week when he does work or sometimes even when he doesn't work, I'll tell him I need a, a day to myself. So let's go back a little bit in terms of the understanding you had going into this. You had mentioned in the previous episode that early on, he had talked about wanting to live together and you had said that you wouldn't do that unless engaged. And now this one year anniversary has come about and he's saying now he doesn't want to get married nor engaged. Is that correct? That is correct. So tell me more about that. He says he's not ready to get married or engaged. He feels like we still need to get to know each other. He has mentioned moving in together first, but I still had, I'm still steadfast about not moving in unless I have some kind of commitment, which is a ring showing that we're going to work towards um, marriage. And during our dinner, our anniversary dinner, we talked about, that's when I brought up the subject about where we were at in our relationship. And that's when he told me that he wasn't ready to get married or propose quite yet. Um, and then he asked me, well, would you get married tomorrow? I was like, well, no. I go, I wouldn't want to get married tomorrow. I'd want to be engaged first, have some time to plan our wedding and get to know each other more. Maybe you possibly moving in and then plan a date from there, I told him. And what was his response to that? He said that he didn't feel ready. Okay. So there's a couple of things I'm hearing that might be of help to you and certainly to the listeners. So I'm going to ask you, when you say you need to get to know him more after the amount of time you have spent together. What is it that you don't know? What it would be like to live with him and what are his moods like? When he gave me the silent treatment for three days, that really affected me because in my previous relationship, my ex-husband would give me the silent treatment quite a bit and he would do it for, it started with a few days, then it went to a week and then it went to two weeks. So that triggered me and I would, personally like to know what it's like to live with him to make sure he's I'm not getting into the same situation. So that was my hesitation. I see. Okay. Tell me about this quote unquote silent treatment. Okay. So it wasn't the conversation that started the silent treatment. We were playing wrestling on the bed and and I pushed him off the bed and he got hurt and he got really upset. And we had plans that night to go to the movies and he got up and told me he did not want to go to the movies with me, got his things and left. And I didn't hear from him for three days. When you say he got hurt, what happened? Well, he um, scratched his back against like the dresser handle. Uh huh. So it, it, it bruised him a little bit. Um, well, I left a red mark at least because I looked, you know, I didn't just say laugh and move on. I actually, I was like, oh, I'm so sorry that happened. Let me check your back. And I did look at his back before, you know, before he decided to get up and leave. And I told him profusely how sorry I was. And I, that wasn't my intent for him to get hurt. And he got up, act like he was getting all, the only things he has here is um, a toothbrush and um, shaving cream. He got those things and left. And I felt like he was leaving indefinitely because he doesn't have things here. Like he doesn't have any clothes here, nothing like that. But he did get those few little items that he did have. So it made me feel like I was being abandoned. So he left and normally he would be texting you or calling and he did not for three days? Exactly. So he texts me every night. He texts me every morning. He lets me know when he's going to sleep because he does work night shift. Yeah. So those three days I didn't hear from him at all. And did you reach out to him? After the third, on the third day I did. And what did you say? I reach out to him. I, if I recall correctly, I told him something along the lines that I wanted to check in on him. I hope he wasn't too injured. I may have said something along the lines that I want to, I'd like to be able to talk about this. I don't know what caused him to not talk to me for a couple of days. And I felt that it was unfair. And that was it. And that I was sorry that he had gotten hurt. It wasn't my intention. And he said? So after that, um, that text was sent. He didn't respond to me for quite a while. To me, it seemed forever. He responded to me like around the time that he would have already been going to work. So, and he kept it really short. He said that he was fine, that he didn't want to talk about it, but that we could see each other the next day. 
So I waited until the morning to text him back because it was really late. And I told him I was happy to hear that he was, he was okay. But I would want to talk about this because for me, getting the silent treatment isn't something I would want to continue in a relationship because I don't think it's healthy. So later on that day, when he woke up, he texted me and said, okay, we can talk about it. So he came over and we talked about it. And I was honest with him. I told him my, what, how it affected me and how that's not the kind of relationship I wanted and how in the past that had been done to me before and how I wanted to make sure that I wasn't repeating the same mistakes or being with the same kind of person I was in the past and how um, if that were to happen again, I wouldn't want to be in a relationship like this because I can't deal with a person like that. I just couldn't have that in my life again. And what did he do or say? He said he understood and that he was really sorry that I didn't deserve that and that he, his reason for not contacting me was that he was really embarrassed and I asked him, were you, in your head, were you thinking of breaking up? Like, were you thinking of no longer seeing me? He said no, that that wasn't in his head, that he just needed some space because he was really angry and embarrassed. So after this, you made up. What have you talked about, the two of you, or and or done to ameliorate the possibilities of something like this happening again? Mm, we don't rough house anymore. Okay, but Sarai, that's not the issue. Okay. Do you know what I mean when I say that? No, I don't think I do. The very small issue here is that he got hurt when the two of you, adults, consented to roughhouse. That means he could have gotten hurt, you could have gotten hurt. No one intended for anybody to get hurt, correct? Correct. He happened to. It's not about him getting hurt, it's how he handled it. I see. So you two not roughhousing anymore has little to do with it because it could be anything whereby he can't handle his emotions, his anger, talk to you. He takes his toys and goes home when something goes wrong. This is the issue. Yeah, you're right. But this is the bigger issue. He hasn't done it since and we haven't had any arguments or situations where that has happened again. Mm -hmm. But it hasn't been addressed, except that you had said, if it happens again, I'm done. Meaning, if you ghost me again, I'm done. Okay. I felt like it was addressed when he told me why he had given me the silent treatment and how he felt. But was that not the case then? I Should I have asked for more information? It's about him saying, I realize how that was unfair, how that was immature, and that I didn't handle it well by not talking to you. I won't do that again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he could have said those words. Did he allude to anything like that? Let me think back for a minute. He did say that he, his pride was hurt. He, I, if I, I don't, I don't remember. I can't, I don't want to put words in, in this. I don't want to say things that I can't remember what exactly he said, but I do remember him saying that, yeah, we would communicate better because that was one of the things that I told him that I wanted communication in this relationship. And that if something like that happened again, that I would hope that he would, yeah, if he needed some time to take it, but be in contact with him and say, hey, I left because I'm not, I need some time to cool off. I'll co contact you in whatever, like two or three hours and let me know what's going on. But being away from me for a day was, is going to be like acceptable to me. I do remember telling him that as well. Like I understand we all need space, but I expect him to communicate with me when he does need that space. And he agreed to that. And he said, yeah, that he would work on his communication. But I can't recall if he said something along the lines that um, he would he would handle it differently and how he would handle it. Okay. It's certainly not the biggest thing in the world, but it does raise a red flag on how he handles anything that bothers him. Now, most of this, is for men just on a scale. He took it to a pretty nth degree when obviously when two people do something like that, in other words, you're playing a game. What is inherent in playing a game with someone? Someone will win, someone will lose. When it's a physical thing, somebody could get hurt. It's a lack of taking personal responsibility. Okay, he got shamed for him as a man getting pushed off the bed and not feeling strong enough or something of the sort, but his handling of it was seriously remiss, immature, 
door. And just for my edification, what kept you from contacting him later to see if he was okay? I wanted to see what he, how he would handle the situation. I wanted to take a step back and see how long it would take him. When he got his things, his toothbrush, his shaving cream, whatever, and he left to go, what did you say at that point? Mm, I tell him, I go, are you leaving? I said, I was sorry. I didn't intend for you to get hurt. Are you sure you want to leave like this? And he said, yeah, and he left. So that was six weeks ago. You've moved on from that and nothing like it has happened since. You're continuing to have dinner together every night. I'm assuming you're making the dinner? No, a lot of times he'll um, either pick something up or he'll come and pick me up and we'll go to dinner. Um, I rarely cook, maybe maybe once a week if I feel like it, but usually I don't. He'll pick up something or we'll go to dinner or we'll go for a walk and then have dinner afterwards. And I would say it's probably, he has actually, so I would say seven days out of the week, it's probably five days out of the week that we may be sick because sometimes he'll take his own day to do things that he needs to do at his house or his apartment. And then when I also take my own day in addition to that. But the communication has been good otherwise. Yeah. Some, yeah. Sometimes I feel like um, he does. I just get this sense that he's holding back and doesn't tell me anything. And I feel like I need to like when in retrospect, when I look back at our dinner conversation for anniversary, I should have asked him what is it holding him back from proposing or moving towards marriage or asking for marriage? I should have asked him that. I wish I would. I wish I had the ability to draw him out more because I, I think you're right. He's not a very good communicator. Um, and apparently, neither am I. <laughs> but I mean, I know what my wants and needs are and I express those, but I don't feel like he does. What are you making of the fact that after a year, he doesn't want to get engaged? Hmm. I think it's sufficient time in my mind to know if you want to have a relation with that person, period. What to me that means, okay, I've spent this year with this person. I like them and love them enough where I will work through anything with them. And I do want to be committed to this person. So but, I want to get married. Or, But you are not. And you told him so. He asked you, well, would you? And you said what you said. Instead of saying, there's nothing that's perfect. There's no one that is perfect. I know enough to know that I am willing to wake up next to you every day, be a partner, and work through things together. And if you do not know that after this year together, then it sounds like something is off for you. Yeah, I could have said that. And like I said, I know my communication skills lack, and I pro I could have probably expressed that a lot better. And instead of just shutting down like I did, I should have asked more questions or expressed what my view was but I didn't. You can have this engagement at the very least. He does need to move to make that decision. But the issue is you are afraid of losing him. Yeah. And when the woman is afraid to take a stand, we can't expect that the man will be unafraid of getting married. Yeah, that makes sense. And I know he senses um, that I've pulled back a little bit because well, this engagement dinner just happened last week. And he asked me what's wrong. And of course, I say nothing. But, but I haven't, I've only seen him like maybe twice since our engagement dinner. But I feel like I need to tell him, you know, I do have stuff on my mind. But I don't know if I want to, I don't want to feel like I'm anxious for this engagement or marriage. I want it to be his idea, like he said. So, No, don't misunderstand me. It's typically not the man's idea. Oh, okay. Men intrinsically are not going to proffer commitment fully via marriage and engagement unless they are at a point in their lives whereby they feel they must move forward with having children and that that's the way to do it. Otherwise, men take the path of least resistance and will do as little as possible in terms of being committed. It is not their natural desire or stance, most typically. And if they know the woman in the equation doesn't require it, they will not come forward with it. Hmm, interesting. Well, he knows I require it because from the beginning, like I've told him that that was my intention to date someone to get married. So he knows that's my requirement. No, he knows that that's what you say. Now he knows after that 
anniversary dinner that you will accept what is. That's what he knows. Men do not go by what we say. They go by what we do. And you're saying, well, I'm pulling back a little. He doesn't much care as long as he doesn't have to wrestle with a huge decision whereby he gets to have you but not take on the responsibility that men see marriage as being. I see. Yes, I could see that. Yeah. Okay. If you know my book, we as women see commitment as a natural outgrowth of love. It just happens for us. We love, we have sex, we spend time with the man, we like him, we love him, we're committed. Just happens. Does not happen for men at all all. Men view commitment as a responsibility. It is the puppy principle at work. We love all puppies. We want to love on them, cuddle them, play with them, be around them. It is a whole different thing to take on the responsibility of one. Doesn't mean we don't love it, but doesn't mean we're going to adopt it either. Same thing. Yeah, I am familiar with that. So you will need to do the work around the fear and anxiety that comes up in your subconscious mind mostly. So it's not even conscious as much as it is on a subconscious level around abandonment, not being truly worthy of not being abandoned, not being valued, not being enough, having to people please, and all the anxiety that comes from that because that's your programming. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Because even when I think about, okay, I've already told him how I feel about marriage. He's telling me he doesn't want to get married or engaged to me. And the back of my head, I'm thinking, okay, you've set your standards and he's not listening to you. What's your next step? And of course, my mind just goes crazy with all these ideas. And oh, if you do leave him, he's going to find somebody else and she's going to be better. And ah, yeah, Mm -hmm. my mind just races. Yes, yes. And that's a normative thing when you've been programmed that love is not truly safe, that you have to be something that someone else wants in order to be loved and to get the attention you need. And that came from your time from birth to about age seven. And then after age seven, it's just confirmed over and over and over again. And so it is a program that you run on. And to break away from that takes a lot. Because here's what I can tell you. You accepting that on your anniversary dinner did not set the stage for you to get what you want. You showed him, well, I'm going to accept whatever. And then you also did a little bit of concurrent damage, so to speak, which is, I don't know that I want you either. Huh, I can't take that back. What do I do from here? Well, you can. It's it's going to take some work. And this is why it's so imperative that in relationships like this, where there is a question in the woman's mind about how to do it, and the concurrent anxiety that is a part of it for most everyone I've ever worked with, it's just imperative that you do have someone to do it with you. In other words, there are women out there who, because the stars aligned, perhaps, when they were born, and their attachment style is so secure because they got absolutely everything they needed and the programming of you are worthy, whole, safe, valued, absolutely lovable, exactly as you are, and they have little to no anxiety around this lovability. Well, I'm not one of those, unfortunately. Welcome to the group, because most everyone, because we all started as babies, and there is no perfect situation, and certainly our modern way of having to parent now creates enormous anxiety in children that 99.9% of the population has some sort of insecurity and a bit of insecure attachment in this way. I hear you. Yeah. So is there, what I do at this point, do I break up? I don't want to break up with him because he is a very good man, but I don't want him to lose respect for my boundaries and I don't want him to take me for granted. So what I do at this, how do I, how do I, how do I fix this? Yeah, you're going to have to navigate it in a way that I trust you're enjoying Make Him Wonder. 
and that you're getting a lot of helpful information for the life of love you desire and deserve. So if you're not part of the 8020 Wonder Club yet, you need to be because now Make Him Wonder is exclusive, a members only club to listen to every episode, past, present, and future in full, all ad free. The 8020 Wonder Club is a Make Him Wonder membership that gives you all of seasons one, two, and three in a categorized list by age and relationship status, and a multimedia library of my content, including my book, relationship evals, and my Mechanics of Men Mindset Manual, a weekly action step you can focus on to attract and keep the man of your dreams and have him committing to you completely in the coming months. Make this the moment you start living as an 80-20 Wonder Woman, because love, like life, is best lived in 80-20. When you do 80% of what works with men, the 20% you don't won't much matter. Join the 80-20 Wonder Club by going to the 8020wonder.club. Don't miss out. Go now to the 8020wonder.club. You and your man will be glad you did. We started to talk about this before, and maybe you've done a little bit of the work. I don't know. Uh, but you're going to have to get your self-concept raised in a way whereby you are feeling much stronger, much more worthy, much safer, less anxiety. This is work that you're going to need to do away from him. And when I say away from him, meaning you can be in the relationship with him, but it's going to go through some growing pains if you do this correctly, as well it should, because he has some growth work to do as well. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And whether you do that with me or someone else, it just needs to be done. Because until we, as the woman in the equation, know 100% of our value, worthiness, inherent lovability, aside from any particular man, we will have a difficult time navigating our feelings of love and attachment with a man that we love. And that's what's happening here. Mm, yeah, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And when you have such a strong self-concept and sense of self, worthiness, value, thoughts of him leaving, finding somebody else, they won't even enter your mind. It will be what I know I deserve, what I know is best in relationships, which is commitment. He will do best. You know that it's very important for a man to make the decision. And unfortunately, in our society, we've got it all ass backwards, meaning that we feel we should absolutely 100% know before making any kind of commitment like engagement. I'm here to tell you that's not the way it should be working. It's we get the man to a place whereby he makes a decision. His decision is, I know I want this woman for my lifetime and my wife. And he proposes. That's when you will see him at his relationship best. And that is when you can then fully assess. It's interesting to me that so many people say, oh, well, I need to live with him first. I need to know it needs to be years, etc., etc. because I wouldn't ever want to break off an engagement. Well, better to break off an engagement than get divorced. But so many more people will get divorced than break off an engagement. Wow. Huh. wow. That's what's ass backwards about it. Mm -hmm. That is a time where the woman, after, yes, in all good faith, if you know that there's anything you want to explore about marrying this man, you say yes. And that is the time whereby you get to really, really know because then you see him at his best, truly committed. He's not. You need to find out the why, and it likely has little to nothing to do with you. Yeah. Now, it can in that you are not presenting as a woman who values herself and her time enough, whereby you're saying you as the man after a year should know, especially when you're talking about your age group. In other words, you're both not 25. Yep, correct. 
this would be very different if it were, you know, you're, you're both very young, you're thinking of marrying, having children, very, very serious decision. And yes, it might take more than a year, but there's little more the two of you need to know. What you're saying to each other is, I'm not sure I can work out the issues I already know are there. You're likely not going to find out many more. They're all likely pretty much there right now. And you're both too afraid because of your programming to move through it. And somebody's got to lead the way. And the leader in this way of the relationship is the woman, not the man. You see, and I always thought it was the man, but you're right. I mean, we both have our careers. We don't have financial stuff to work through. We, so that's not an issue. And neither one of us want kids. So we know that you're right. I mean, yeah, you're so right. You're spot on, Paula. And it goes even a little deeper in that it's not that you both don't have these things in front of you. It's that you're expecting him, the male in the situation, to have skills and proclivities that generally they do not. And anyone who's listened to me for any amount of time knows what I talk about with this in terms of the mechanics of men, that you're tantamount to being on the side of the road in the middle of the desert with no cell service and you don't have provisions and 200 miles into the desert, you break down on the side of the road, just the two of you in the blazing hot sun. Who is going to look to whom to fix that car and get you out of there? The woman's going to look to the man to lead. Yes, and that is normative. But in a relationship, it is exactly opposite. And in that analogy, what's happening, it's tantamount to him turning to you and saying, you fixed the car. Well, that would be ridiculous. And it's as ridiculous to ever look to a man for anything regarding fixing a relationship. Now, the understandably, when you're stuck on the side of the road with the car issue, he's going to lead it. And he may say, look, we got to jack this car up. So you got to help me. I'm going to get rocks. I'm going to get, you know, a lever, but you've got to shore up all your strength and you're going to have to help me get under this car. And you will do everything in your power because the car is analogous to the relationship, right? Yep. Yes. So you're leading the way in this, and it's how you lead it that he can feel safe knowing you've got this, and then he will follow your lead. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. But if you show him, I don't know either, or what I'm doing, it's like him saying, oh my God, I don't know how to fix a car. I'm not going to be able to do this. I can't change a tire. Whatever it is, doesn't make you feel safe, and you might get stuck. Yeah. And that's what's happening. Hmm. Yeah, and he's not going to feel safe if, if he feels my hesitation. He's not. It doesn't make him feel safe. You know, likely too, if you listen to me, men need two things. Above all, to feel that they can make that decision and commit. And that is under the heading of safety and happiness. And under the heading of safety are two things. Safe that you are in the Madonna category of Freud's Madonna whore dichotomy. I'm sure he feels that. You are a woman for a relationship, not just a girl to have fun with. So you've likely got that sewn up. I have no doubt about that. The second is that he feels safe from your emotions. And I'm not hearing that you have been highly emotional, had breakups, are difficult to deal with your emotions, any of that. So I think that's pretty good too. Why I'm saying you have a good chance here. The way you handled yourself during the little ghosting you did for the three days showed that you're even keel and not reactionary and not too highly emotional. You didn't cause a lot of drama. So all of that was good. It took a lot to hold back. I mean, oh, it took a lot not to call him, not to go to his house and be like, what's your problem? <laughs> mm -hmm. But yeah, but you did it. Yeah, I mean, I'm, yep. You did it. Yeah. The meditations did help. Great. So you're saying you're using the sleep meditations? During that time I did because it was very difficult for me and I tend to, I'm not consistent with it enough, but yeah, during that time I used the meditations. Mm -hmm. Excellent. But we don't want to just do it in times of trouble. 
If you're going to up your game, you need to be doing it consistently because we will always fall back on our programming. It's not that we take out the program. We never take it out. We just have to continually override it. And that you must be putting in consciously what you want your subconscious to be thinking and then use the sleep meditations as well. So just to go back to the other thing a man needs to have is the feeling of happiness, meaning that he makes you happy. Safety and happiness. And I think, generally speaking, what I'm hearing is that he does feel he makes you happy. However, the energetic stuff that is coming off of you is anxiety around this relationship. And that can be confusing to the man about whether he truly makes you happy or not. Oh, yeah, I can see. Yep, I can see that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So with some work, you can do this. No, you don't want to just break up out of the blue. That would be, I believe, a wrong move because you have shown him a great deal of being even keel about this relationship. So much so that he does take it for granted, but it's not all bad. Okay, how so? But it's not all bad. And that question immediately connotes to me, you see, that's coming from a deep anxiety that, oh my gosh, it must be all bad, when right in front of you is showing you that, no, everything is fine. He sees you every day. He wants to be with you. Oh, you're right. And he's so consistent, Paula. I mean, after a year, he still texts me every morning. He still texts me good night every night. I mean, he is so consistent. And I still don't feel secure enough. I mean, what is with that? Exactly. <laughs> why would even? Why would I still have anxiety over that? That's ridiculous. No, I'm talking to you. I can see it. Excellent. That's where true change happens. Excellent. That's what is at the core of this. When you change that, everything will change. That's the work that needs to be done, along with the little things about him here and there. But you're not ready to do anything along the lines of you know, breaking this off. First of all, I don't think it requires that. But what it does require is that you really get to work on your subconscious programming, your self-concept, and manifesting what it is that you truly want. And then there will come a sweet spot whereby you will be able to present what it is that you absolutely need and want. And he, I absolutely know, will then do it. It doesn't mean it's going to be a straight line trajectory. There may be a little bit of a hiccup, but that's the work that it takes. And all of these things together, what I'm talking about here, the mindset, the self-concept, the manifesting, and the mechanics of this vis-a-vis -vis when you then state your case, so to speak, and then he may go off for a while and you will be ready to handle his absence while he goes through what he needs to go through to make that ultimate decision. Mm, yeah, I see that. I could see, I could see how that would work. Mm -hmm. And it does. And that's my lure him in, lure him back program, because it's typically a necessity for every relationship whereby, Can't. you know, the uh, case hasn't, you know, easily come. Listen, people run the gamut of easy, easy roads where everything just flows into an easy, breezy engagement in marriage. Well, that's very few and far between because... Yeah, unfortunate. Right? Yeah, men are not us. And it doesn't work like that. There's a very old joke uh, that kind of says it very easily in terms of relationships. So it's what do two women bring when they're going to meet for the first time on a first date? When two women meet for a first date, so a lesbian relationship, what do they bring to that date? And it's a joke. Nothing. No, the joke is a U-Haul because it, and, and what that joke says, it's stereotypical that women are about relationships, meaning they like someone, they want to be together, they just immediately are bonded. It's the man in the equation that makes things not go so easily because he doesn't bond. Two women bond. If they like each other and they're having sex, they're bonded. Men don't bond through time and sex. Mm -hmm. That's why a man can be with a woman for years and not marry her, get out of that relationship, turn around, and in six weeks marry someone else. Oh, that's my biggest fear. 
it's not fair, right? It's like that old saying, nothing's fair in love and war. It's not fair. Yeah. We are night and day, sun and rain, on or off, stop or go, male or female. Why homosexual relationships fare much better? Statistics particularly show male homosexual relationships and marriages are much longer lasting. Typically, they do not have the divorce rate or the breakup rate that heterosexual couples have. Well, that makes sense. They see the world the same way. They're not different like night and day. Yeah, very, very hard, but absolutely doable. And men are best in committed relationships. They are best, they are happiest, and they are healthiest. So this isn't about just us getting what we want. We're giving life to a man of happiness and health in a way that he would not have it if he stays single. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you're going to have to do that work first and foremost and put all of your focus on you. Because what I can tell you about any kind of insecure attachment is immediately the focus goes all on the other person, what they're thinking, what they're doing, what they're wanting, how they're behaving. Yeah, that's true. And I do find myself focusing a lot on him. And when I do, I have to talk myself out of it. Like, okay, refocus here. What are you doing? Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. That's good. That's good that you know that. You're already ahead of the game in that way. Now it's really focusing on it and really putting it into practice. And certainly you, you can do it by yourself, but getting a coach or someone to work with with that is going to make it go much, much, much faster. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you're right. I think, I think I do need someone to guide me through my anxiety because although I do a decent job of it, I, I can tell it's just a coding. It's temporary, but I need to get to the, deep, the deeper, the deeper issues and get to the point where I'm not spiraling like that. Mm -hmm. yep. yeah, if you feel you're spiraling, then yes. Mm -hmm. My mind spirals. It goes into, I make up stories. <laughs> ah, okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh huh. And that is deeply ingrained from, I mean, it's programming. You didn't know what you didn't know when you were zero to seven and your love interests were your mom and your parents having to figure out what you needed to do and be to get love from them. And make no mistake, from zero to seven, there is no differentiation between love and attention. Hmm. Children connote attention and presence with love. If they're getting attention, they are loved. And for both of you, what I'm hearing is that both of you have a certain degree of insecure attachment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. And sometimes I'm afraid that he would be able to let go very easily, but his actions don't always show that. No, they don't. No, they don't. Mm -mm. That's right. But you are thinking that he will just easily break it off. And then you got some what you believe to be confirmation by those three days. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, it's not confirmation though. No, he has been quite shamed in the past and had a very tough time with feeling a bit emasculated. That's what I sense from that too, when that happened. Mm -hmm. Yes. So I want to make sure to answer your questions today. What other questions do you have for me? How do I move forward from here? I don't, like you said, I'm happy to hear that you said that breaking up isn't the right thing. I'm happy to hear that. And you're right. He knows I'm mulling over this because I'm that kind of person. And I know I have work to do, but I don't want him to disrespect my boundaries and to think that, oh, everything's okay. I can just continue this way and everything's fine. I don't want that. What kind what? of conversation do we need to have? <laughs> right now? Or whatever. Nothing. Mm -hmm. We would need to get to work. I hope that you can because right away you went to what do I need to do with this relationship? What do I need to say to him? Again, the focus in the wrong place. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah. The focus is you need to get to work on you getting yourself to a place whereby you know that you embody love, you are it, you feel it, you feel worthy and whole and satisfied and secure and safe. And then, and this doesn't take long, immediately when you get to work on this, and most of my clients say, you know, it's about two weeks of really focused work on that and you start to feel it. We got to do some manifestation around it as well, because manifesting and knowing that you can have what you want puts you in a state of 
feeling much more secure about the relationship because you know you're going to get what you want and you are getting it. Now that sounds like a little woo-woo, but it's true. And when you do it the right way, that's what happens. And then he starts seeing the difference and experiencing you in a different way. This is so much more powerful than talking. You start to do it. You've done really about 20% of it by you just taking one day a week off, so to speak, because it's like the tip of the iceberg. That 20% is the tip of the iceberg. Well, where's the rest of the 80% that's the real iceberg underneath the water? That's what has to be done now. And when you put those two together, you will have that wholeness that he will absolutely know he is safe to tie his boat to, so to speak and will want to take the forever journey with you because he feels safe, you are happy, you are whole, it is not anxious, you see? Yeah, yeah, you feel safe. Yep. We all want to feel safe. It's so true. Mm-hmm. So you have to leave here today knowing that you can. We can talk off the air about that, about how you do that. As I said, whether it's me or somebody else, you need to be doing that. And this isn't a, a one-time conversation with him. No, not at all. Yeah. He is worth you doing this work. Most importantly, you are worth you doing this work. Oh my God, yes. <laughs> right? That's the key. And when you put yourself first and foremost, like I always say, focus on you and he will do right by you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I believe it. And you're right. Yes. You need to do that work. I can feel it. I can, I can just tell you're right. I can, I know. Exactly. That's your inner knowing. Mm -hmm. Now it's just just to find out how to do it and then step by step start doing it in a way that will give you the results you desire and deserve. You can have this. I'm hearing everything from these two episodes that we've done whereby you can. But he is taking the path of least resistance and now he feels very good because you've just accepted the status quo and he's going to coast along. But when you do this work on you and he starts to feel that inner shift and it is so subtle but the man gets it and that's when everything will start to turn and that's when we along the weeks of working together then craft what you say how you say it and most importantly when you do it mm, yeah that when is always the important part right that is not now Not now. And there's no reason to at the moment. But you are going to have to show that you now feel differently about you and know that you are worthy. And in a few weeks' time, and we would have to talk and, again, craft the when here. Mm -hmm. Timing is everything. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I like that you said that we have to show that there's a change in me where and automatically I was thinking that he needs to see there's a change in my reaction to him, you know, so that's interesting that you said it that way. Exactly. You know, it's funny. It's why it's why couples therapy until recently has so not tended to work for people because most people go into couples therapy attempting to change the other person. Mm -hmm. That's not how it works. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And like one of my favorite manifesting and self-concept people I recommend to watch on YouTube is Dylan James. He starts always with become the change you seek to experience. Become the change and then you will see it happen. And that's what this work sets out to do. And then the mechanics of it come into play of the what we text, how we say it, when we do it, etc. And most importantly, staying strong through the change you will be inciting in him because he's got to go through some. Oh, wow. Okay. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yes. So my actions are going to affect him too, and he's going to go through changes. Wow, interesting. Of course, that's how it works. He's going to go through many, and he will see for himself and get to a point of being at a place to make that decision and take it on. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I have no doubt if you do the work. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I agree with you. I know I know. I need to do the work because you're right. A man can sense, just like we have our senses, a man can sense when there's something wrong. And they might not be able to tell what it is because we're not very open sometimes. But I'm sure you're like exactly like you said. He senses my anxiety. Yes. Yeah. 
Mm -hmm. Yes, sure. And no matter how we try to obfuscate it, it, it's thinly veiled. It's there, and that's what they're going on. Because don't forget, men, while not typically intuitive, they have an innate sense because they're like the predators of the species. They know, like they're Leo the lion standing on the sidelines, they know which elk in the pack is the most vulnerable. They just know it. And that's the one they go after, right? It's the same thing. They just know it and they know what they can, quote, get away with. Mm -hmm. And he knew he could say to you, no, not ready to get engaged or married. And that would be that. And nothing would change. Mm -hmm. And nothing should at the moment because you are not at a place of being completely confident, all-knowing and whole to say, this is what. I want now, but you're absolutely going to get there. I have no doubt. If you do this work, you will get there and then you will have this and you will have marriage. I have no doubt. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm glad you have faith in me. I'm glad <laughs> you see it. I, do. I do see a tiny light at the end of the tunnel. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So thank you for coming on today and updating us. And it was a very interesting discussion, kind of encapsulated everything that we talk about here yeah. on the Make Him Wonder podcast. I trust you got a lot of great information and gained valuable insight from my coaching of Soraya on what she needs to do starting today to change her mindset and enact the mechanics of men approach that will get her the complete commitment she desires from Fred. It's why this podcast exists and why there are several episodes like this one that I choose to bring you in their entirety. But you may not know that 98% of Make Him Wonder episodes are only partially available on YouTube and podcast listings platforms and why I invite you to check out the 8020 Wonder Club, an exclusive membership only club of the Make and Wonder podcast, where you get each episode in its entirety, all ad free. Over 150 episodes with a real woman coming to me with a real life love situation like you just heard. All are categorized by age and relationship status. So you can choose episodes that pertain to your unique situation, categories of 20s, 30s, 40s and 50s, getting an ex back, situationships, dating divorced, older women, younger men, and much more. Plus, all new episodes the moment they're formatted and ready to be aired. No more waiting for partial episodes to drop here on YouTube or your podcast listening platform. The 8020 Wonder Club also includes my Making Magic with Men Mindset Manual, a weekly video series of mindset and mechanics practices for you to do at your own pace each and every week. Join the club monthly and cancel at any time or save by committing to a 6 or 12 month membership. And not only will you save by committing to more, you'll receive a full coaching intensive experience where you'll be talking to me personally. You choose the date anytime during your 12 months and I'll be answering all your questions on getting what you want with the man you want. Don't miss out on how to make your man wonder in the right way to have the right results you desire and deserve. Go now to the 8020 wonderclub That's the 8020 wonderclub You and your love will be glad you did.